Hello and welcome to this Japan Society webinar, one of our regular series on topics in current affairs and business. My name is Bill Emmett, and as many of you know, I have the honor of chairing the Japan Society. Today, I have a special honor, that of welcoming as our speaker and discussant, the man who is president of the Japan Society, a title held by all Japanese ambassadors to the UK, thanks to the Society's origins in 1891 to 92, and the special support given to it at that time by Emperor Meiji. It is normal for the Japan Society to be able to hear from the Japanese ambassador to the UK, just as every year we hear from the British ambassador to Japan in their annual lecture. But these, as we all know, have not been normal times, which is why Ambassador Hayashi Hajime has had such an unusual introduction to the UK and to Japan Society members. He was designated ambassador to the UK in December 2020, could arrive in London only in February 2021, and has so far appeared for, before us as a group only at our AGM online in September. And that's why I'm delighted now to welcome him, him online before us again with a really nice large group of Japan Society members. Ambassador Hayashi has had a distinguished career in Japan's foreign service before arriving with us in London. For example, he served as minister at the Embassy of Japan in the United States from 2007 to 2010, and was deputy chief of mission in India, 2010 to 2013. Then in 2017 to 19, he was ambassador to Belgium and chief of mission to NATO for part of that time, 2018 to 19. And then prior to taking up his post in London, Ambassador Hayashi served as Assistant Chief Cabinet Secretary and Deputy Secretary General of the National Security Secretariat, and so in that role, paid special attention to the expanding defense and security relationship between our two nations. The format today is that I will first ask Ambassador Hayashi to make some brief opening remarks, following which I will have a discussion with him and, most importantly, invite you to submit your questions. So, Ambassador Hayashi, dear President of the Japan Society, over to you and welcome to this very special meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank Bill for your very kind introduction of myself uh, to the audiences uh, this morning. Uh, this is wonderful uh, to have uh, th this kind of opportunity to speak directly well to uh, quite distinguished members of Japan society here, as Bill uh, very much well clearly indicated, uh, this is a society which has long and uh, extinguished, distinguished uh, tradition uh, for uh, well, more than a century, as a matter of fact. And as a president of the society, I'm so happy uh, to uh, see, uh, well, uh, even on, through online, but uh, with many people, many uh, members and the uh, audiences, uh, those who are interested in our bilateral ties and friendship. And, uh, well, I'd like to utilize uh, today's opportunity to spend uh, as much time uh, for dialogue and the answering and responding uh, to the uh, points raised by uh, the audiences this morning. Uh, for that purposes, I uh, hope to make a very short uh, introductory remarks and the, I do not want to make uh, some uh, reading out of prepared statement. Well, as uh, Bill uh, told us that the, uh, it is uh, nine months since my arrival here in the United Kingdom. It was early February this year uh, in the midst of lockdowns caused by, of course, pandemic uh, uh, of, by COVID-19, and the, uh, which uh, made us uh, very well uh, keenly realize that the, uh, we need to work uh, to uh, tackle with this pandemic. Uh, of course, uh, here, states play uh, quite important central roles in each uh, well, population of the states. However, international cooperation is necessary. Without that, we cannot rectify uh, this, uh, uh, well, uh, m uh, quite uh, many areas of damages or even losses caused by this pandemic. 
And here, uh, of course, well, uh, it depends upon uh, policies by each state, but uh, international cooperation, particularly uh, for vaccinations, uh, going on. Uh, cent central player is uh, COVAX, that is, of course, uh, COVID-19 vaccine global access and the uh, Japan together with UK and other partners working very closely uh, with this uh, international uh, uh, body uh, to facilitate vaccination, particularly uh, toward uh, those populations in developing countries. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Japanese government together with uh, well, a couple of uh, other uh, well, organizers like uh, Gavi and so on uh, to host a COVAX summit meeting in June this year and uh, announced Japan's pledge of the 1 billion US dollar assistance uh, for the entire force of vaccination and particularly 60 million doses of vaccine in kind uh, assistance. And also, uh, on top of that, announced uh, Japan's assistance to build up, establish so-called so, so cold chains, uh, in particularly in developing countries. So uh, this is a, this is a part of our efforts, but the, uh, of course, well, uh, one single country cannot do everything, uh, obviously. And uh, I understand uh, uh, collaborations, cooperation among partners, international partners, uh, like-minded partners, uh, so important, and the, uh, this is uh, what is going on uh, today. And the other topic is, uh, of course, uh, everyone uh, could realize uh, so clearly and we have some uh, good memory, uh, which is, uh, well, climate change issue until very recently, well, actually until uh, Saturday uh, last week, uh, UK hosted COP26, that is uh, uh, quite important uh, to, uh, work internationally uh, to come to the uh, uh, agreement and the uh, shared uh, roadmaps for the future of uh, tackling uh, climate change issue. And here as well, of course, well, uh, I commend uh, the government and the people of the United Kingdom uh, to, uh, for its leadership and untiring efforts uh, to uh, cope with different opinions of the world and come to the uh, conclusion of the agreement uh, in Glasgow. Uh, that is a, a tremendous uh, milestone ahead. Of course, well, there are lots of arguments among uh, people concerned, uh, particularly there are uh, enthusiasts uh, who uh, already show, uh, well, uh, sort of, uh, quite uh, negative views or criticism with regard to the result. But the only thing of the world, uh, human society, uh, human beings are to uh, work together, uh, to come to uh, well uh, agreement and shared views for our future efforts. Here, of course, Japan is uh, one of the uh, good collaborators of uh, UK and other like-minded partners and uh, well, uh, I was heavily involved with Japanese response uh, in this COP26, uh, including uh, the uh, visit of Prime Minister Kishida uh, just after the voting uh, of uh, 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 House of Representatives of Japanese Parliament. Uh, that was uh, 31st October. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida flew to Glasgow and only spent uh, some hours, but well, that, that is a, a sort of symbolic uh, kind of uh, well, acts on the part of Japan. The head of government uh, spent time, well, uh, mostly in, in flight, but the, uh, to appear and the, deliver uh, what Japan has in mind with regard to uh, responses and our policies uh, in terms of climate change. Here, uh, Prime Minister Shida announced uh, his Asia en Energy uh, Transition Initiatives, uh, which is uh, to help Asian countries uh, to transform uh, uh, fossil thermal power generation to uh, more uh, climate-friendly, greener uh, kind of uh, energy generation uh, the, uh, with the aim of the uh, amount of 100 million US dollars. And also uh, in order to assist 
uh, developing countries for their uh, transition uh, financial resources uh, uh, definitely need. And here, uh, both public and private sector of Japan will commit uh, 60 billion US dollar for the upcoming five years. But uh, on top of that, uh, Prime Minister Kishida announced a $10 billion uh, addition. And also, uh, among those money, uh, uh, the uh, 14.8 billion uh, US dollar will be uh, allocated for adaptation assistance to other developing countries. And besides, uh, to uh, uh, tackle with deforestation uh, in uh, forestry uh, sector, uh, 240 million US dollar will be committed on the part of Japan. Well, I, I'm sorry to just raise uh, those figures, but well, this is uh, just examples of efforts and seriousness on the part of Japan to work together uh, with partners uh, of uh, like-mindedness and the, uh, share the uh, same or similar uh, direction at age of three. So oh, I understand that this is an issue uh, which need to be addressed uh, continually. Uh, so uh, it's not something like, well, one shot operations, continuing untiring, untiring efforts are necessary uh, on the part of all the countries, states concerned, or uh, many people, many populations concerned. Uh, but uh, I just uh, well uh, pick up two very uh, uh, well clear uh, topics of uh, collaboration uh, between our two nations, two governments, and uh, two peoples. But uh, of course, uh, besides them, uh, quite many issues uh, which uh, are global challenges. To uh, both of us, or many other uh, people, many other states and partners of the world, of course, how to recover from uh, huge uh, damages caused by this pandemic uh, in terms of economic activities is a quite important uh, theme, uh, which has been discussed uh, among uh, government experts, uh, ministers, and uh, prime ministers, uh, head of uh, states and head of governments uh, in such for, uh, fora uh, like G7, G20, and others, etc., and OECD, and etc. So this is a quite important. And here, uh, of course, uh, we are with partners to work together, or in totally different areas uh, which need to be global uh, to be uh, uh, paid by global attention. Is for example. Uh, uh, nuclear disarmament or, uh, well, uh, issues uh, facing of the global uh, world, uh, world entirely uh, to face for the uh, future of security or, or uh, keep our peace and uh, stability. Well, those are quite many issues. Uh, our, well, our governments, uh, I mean, uh, organizations, uh, however, not only government, uh, governments, but also, uh, well, think tanks or intellectuals, NGOs, uh, civil societies uh, working together. And of course, uh, we have quite rich, outstanding traditions of bilateral relations and friendship. Uh, here, are quite many areas. One very significant area is trade and uh, economy. Uh, as a matter of fact, here in the UK, uh, there are there are around 1,000 Japanese companies very active, uh, operate in the uh, UK market uh, or here in the soil, on the soil of the United Kingdom. And the, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, well, I understand about 180,000 uh, jobs are created by those Japanese companies here in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is a very important uh, venue for Japanese businesses. And the, uh, uh, of course, uh, before this uh, Brexit uh, has been done, uh, there used to be uh, some apprehension among many people, including uh, British, uh, uh, my friends, colleagues here, that after Brexit, uh, quite some or even many Japanese businesses uh, would leave the UK uh, because uh, uh, Brexit would make uh, rather less attractive situation, economic situation, uh, business conditions here in the UK. But reality uh, so far is quite opposite. 
uh, there's no such uh, uh, kind of outflow or uh, exodus of Japanese businesses uh, from the United Kingdom. Other than that, uh, we have seen uh, some new initiatives, uh, well, a fresh kind of investment. Uh, well, uh, let me take uh, two examples. Uh, one is that Nissan has announced that they will expand, uh, but spending uh, another fresh one billion pound uh, uh, for their expansion of their uh, factories, fast, uh, manufacturing facilities in Sunderland, uh, north of England, uh, where uh, Nissan will uh, produce electric cars together with uh, batteries for using in, for electric cars. And very recently, actually uh, last Friday, I myself attended a uh, factory opening ceremony in Swindon, uh, well, about uh, an hour and a half or two hours drive from the center of London, where uh, AFL, that is subsidi subsidiary of uh, Fujikura Company of Japan, uh, newly uh, opened uh, manufacturing facility for uh, optic fiber cables. This was uh, the company which used to produce auto parts uh, in that region, but the, uh, under well, a changing uh, business and economic environment, they changed uh, their products uh, to be manufactured in the same area, uh, which is more suitable for the future of UK, uh, or namely that's digitalization. Uh, so uh, optic fiber, uh, with uh, cutting edge Japanese technology uh, would uh, certainly contribute to the uh, digitalization or digital networks, uh, which will be and is quite necessary for further uh, well, leveling up or growth of Britain uh, or people here in the society. So these are two just two, uh, examples, a small tip of a large iceberg, but I'm quite sure uh, Japanese are uh, and continue uh, to be uh, good business partners uh, of many uh, British companies and British business people here. And well, uh, in international term, uh, our framework of trade is rather uh, impressive, I must say, honestly. Uh, well, we, uh, thanks to the efforts of the both sides, uh, Japan and the UK finalized our negotiations on free trade agreement, uh, we call PPA, Economic Partnership Agreement, last year. And the, on the 1st of January, we have uh, we started implementation of this new agreement. This is a, uh, we are so pleased that the, this is the first of this sort of free trade agreement, uh, which uh, UK uh, uh, agreed after, after the Brexit. Uh, took place. Well, this is a wonderful uh, first example, and uh, which certainly provide uh, stability and predictability to the, uh, all the businesses on both sides. And the well, uh, this is uh, not only one, of course. Uh, uh, now uh, the uh, uh, formal process are uh, being uh, taking place uh, with regard to UK's accession entry into CPTPP. Comprehensive Progressive Agreement of Free Trade and uh, well, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, here, uh, fortunately, this year, Japan chairs the entire commission of this uh, trade framework. And also uh, now Japan takes care as a chair country of the working group for UK's accession. And we are working very closely together with other partners of this framework. This is, a, uh, I must say, the the most advanced trade field framework uh, today uh, among now 11 states surrounding uh, Pacific uh, Ocean, but the uh, many uh, welcome UK's accession. And of course, well, this is a process and uh, the agreement consensus made by all the parties concerned are necessary. So uh, let us see uh, the uh, future consequences, but well, uh, many, uh, well, I join many people here in the UK that the, uh, this agreement will be uh, reached uh, very soon so that the UK will be another partner of this important trade framework. 
And uh, just uh, the last word on trade area. Uh, Japan and the UK governments are working very closely for the uh, improvement and reform of international uh, trade framework, trade rules under WTO. Uh, we share so much common or similar positions with regard to uh, these international trade framework. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, quite outdated, and there are lots of areas uh, we need to either strengthen or to set up new rules uh, which uh, need to be uh, in place uh, suitable for this 21st century uh, trading and freer, freer trading system. Yeah, we are good collaborators with each other and we are looking forward to, have, to working closely toward the upcoming ministerial meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, starting at the end of this month. And turning to, uh, well, uh, security and defense cooperation, uh, I myself uh, has been personally involved, as Bill uh, kindly uh, pointed out, uh, in this period for uh, some years. And I was very much well encouraged to see uh, carrier strike group headed by HMS Queen Elizabeth uh, toured uh, Indian Ocean and finally Pacific Ocean and entered the port of Yokosuka uh, during the time of September this year. Uh, because of this uh, uh, COVID-19 and the restrictions of the border measures, I could not have participated in and uh, could not uh, well, uh, welcome, uh, could not have welcomed uh, those uh, fleet uh, in Japan. However, it was wonderful uh, initiatives taken by the side of the uh, UK, particularly uh, Royal Navy and the UK forces. And the, uh, obviously this is a, a one uh, very much more uh, dramatic event. However, uh, here, uh, we have had uh, quite many joint exercises uh, bilaterally and together with other uh, like-minded partners, like the United States, Australia, uh, the Netherlands, uh, New Zealand, and so on, uh, in the area of uh, Pacific Ocean or even Indian Ocean as well. And uh, now we would like to further strengthen uh, this area of security and defense cooperation. Now, uh, formal negotiation started with regard to uh, RAA, reciprocal access agreement, which would uh, make our future joint exercises uh, easier and more effective. And the uh, talks are going on with regard to uh, possible cooperation uh, for the future uh, uh, air jet fighters. Uh, well, uh, that is uh, between the two uh, defense ministries, defense offices of both governments. And well, uh, those are just well, uh, a few examples. But uh, in this area, important point is that both of us share fundamental values of democracies and the freedom, uh, human rights, and also rule of law, in including international law. Uh, which could, of course, apply to freedom of navigation and free usage of uh, sea lanes and the air lanes for uh, trade and communications and everything. So we share fundamental uh, uh, basic understanding. And based upon that, we are now working on specific cooperation. And uh, uh, not uh, lastly, but uh, well, uh, just to uh, next uh, is the area, of course, cultural, scientific, or educational uh, cooperation. This is amazing. Uh, well, uh, thanks to our uh, producers or ancestors, even. Uh, well, since nine, late 19th century, uh, this area has been developed uh, so much. I uh, actually, well, very, very frankly, very honestly, I myself is very much impressed and even uh, well astonished uh, to see uh, such enthusiasts of Japanese culture for uh, scientific cooperation or educational uh, collaboration uh, with Japan here in the UK. Very recently, uh, I have seen a couple of exhibitions or uh, demonstrations such as, uh, well, uh, the, just a couple of examples uh, Hokusai exhibition at the British Museum, for example, or uh, Edo Tokyo exhibition 
at the Ashmolean Museum of Oxford, or uh, Japan Festival, uh, hosted by uh, Royal Gardens Q. Uh, those are just a few examples, but uh, which demonstrate uh, very much more enthusiastic kind of uh, uh, atmosphere, as well as foundation uh, for all the exchanges of culture or science or education with Japan. And the, well, uh, perhaps lots of similarities, but uh, if we come into those kind of points, uh, we could spend uh, quite a long time. But uh, just, uh, just uh, well, uh, touching briefly, uh, we share, uh, of course, island nations, uh, well, uh, geographical uh, characteristics. And also, uh, it seems to me more and more realized that the uh, same or similar kind of mentality to uh, love nature, worship, beauty of nature, which will uh, demonstrate in uh, gardening here, as well as in Japan, for example, or flower arrangements, or those kind of affairs or activities. And sports, uh, I myself is very much encouraged uh, to hear or receive many, many praise and comments or opinions uh, coming from all over the United Kingdom with regard to uh, the uh, Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, that is, uh, well, uh, honestly, 100% of those comments and opinions are were, were positive and they praised uh, the decision on the part of uh, organizers, including government of Japan, to carry out those games under very difficult condition of pandemic caused by COVID-19. And of course, here, uh, I enjoy uh, through a TV, uh, the uh, wonderful performances made by uh, Team GB, uh, British athletes in both Olympic Games as well as in Paralympic Games. In terms of Paralympic Games, well, uh, UK is a, a sort of homeland to uh, uh, nurture uh, those activities. Uh, Stock Mandeville is a center uh, for uh, these activities, as a matter of fact. Uh, in the first few occasions, I understand uh, those Paralympics were called International Stock Mandeville uh, Sports Event. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, Tokyo uh, hosted twice those Paralympic Games. First, of course, uh, in 1964, uh, second of the sorts. And the first time uh, the word uh, Paralympics uh, was used in Tokyo in 1964, and this time, of course. And uh, this is a, a huge, huge, uh, well, activities uh, in order to uh, improve awareness and the social uh, changes of the uh, uh, inclusiveness. Uh, with regard to uh, athletes or people with some challenge, physical challenges. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, since 1964, first time Japan hosted uh, these games, the society has been changing uh, to, more, to be more inclusive. And I believe uh, this year, 2020, provided another fresh stimulus uh, to a Japanese society. Well, not only Japan, but to the entire uh, world, I believe. So those are just few examples. And here, uh, of course, I return back to the activities of Japan society here, which is always, uh, well, a uh, great engine uh, for uh, stimulating and encouraging the people's interests here in UK to uh, Japan. So I thank you, thank very much, uh, Bill, and all those uh, Executives working for the uh, uh, Japan Society and, uh, and also, uh, well, uh, the, uh, all the members of the society and participants and the audiences of this morning. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you very, very much, um, Ambassador, for that very, very comprehensive uh, tour of our horizons uh, and uh, particularly picking up, of course, on the Olympics, on uh, defense cooperation, which is very important, um, on the view of Japanese businesses of the UK, uh, which I thought was particularly uh, interesting, um, and, uh, and naturally of COP26. 
Now, I encourage um, members of the audience to submit questions in chat. A few people have begun to do so, and that's wonderful. Um, I should have pointed out to everyone that this session is being recorded. Um, just it does say that on your Zoom screen, but nevertheless, just as an extra reminder to you that it is being recorded, just if you are if you are concerned about your image or anything. Um, I'm just going to pop a couple of quick questions to the ambassador, and then I will go straight to uh, individuals um, putting questions in chat. But the first question is just almost a selfish one for all the Japan Society. I think, as you've said about cultural exchange and scientific exchange, people to people exchange between the UK and Japan has been very rich and very important. Um, I wonder if you could uh, outline to us how you think this is going to be reestablished after um, with uh, the pandemic um, changing in its character, at least. Uh, we hear of the, with pleasure, of the new um, rules for get admission to Japan for business visitors. They seem, however, really quite cumbersome. There's been a lot of criticism of the six forms that one has to submit and the daily itinerary. Uh, and I wonder what perspective you can give us for the ability to have mutual exchanges of people of all levels, students, uh, researchers, scientists, uh, and business people being resumed in a full way in 2022. Well, thank you very much. That's a quite important point. And the, uh, the very simple answer is that uh, the exchange exchanges have started. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there are a series of relaxation of border images on the part of Japan. Well, uh, Japan suffered, uh, well, not so much well uh, in terms of the number of those, unfortunately, lost their lives or they suffered se seriously uh, with regard to in the cause by COVID-19. But, uh, well, uh, Japan uh, was, uh, in a sense, a couple of steps behind uh, such country like uh, UK or other very much more uh, vanguard countries in terms of the vaccination process in the past. So uh, Japan has very much more cautious and the uh, quite comprehensive uh, uh, manners to uh, make uh, good take care of the uh, uh, possible uh, infections caused by COVID-19. And border measures uh, are uh, some of them. And but uh, it's, it is gradually being relaxed and the, uh, particularly uh, on uh, eight, uh, well, uh, just well, uh, uh, about two weeks uh, before uh, from now, uh, the uh, new uh, well regime uh, for the business people to visit Japan uh, decided, and the, uh, uh, that could be applicable for those uh, business and the possibly government as well uh, to visit Japan uh, with only three days of quarantine uh, length. Of course, uh, two doses of vaccination and the proof of those uh, are necessary. However, uh, this could well uh, start uh, the exchanges of the uh, people in the business field and students, uh, exchange students and the like, well, particularly well, uh, for Japan's purposes, uh, JET participants are started to entering into Japan. Unfortunately, well, uh, those uh, JET well, uh, teachers of English languages uh, from all over the United Kingdom uh, could not uh, go to Japan last year, but they already started uh, and entering into Japan or uh, going to many places, including very rural places, uh, to teach English languages directly as uh, well, uh, native speaker uh, to uh, the students in Japan. And this year's uh, JET participants are uh, now making final preparations, I believe, and entering into Japan very soon, I believe. So, uh, of course, and uh, exchange students uh, as well. So these are started, and but still, uh, some of the restrictions uh, of the border measures necessary, including some uh, self quarantine. Uh, period. However, uh, I think well, uh, we are not in the situation that uh, quite many people uh, just will uh, stop uh, for this kind of in-person exchanges uh, in last year or even until the summer of this year. So I'm quite looking forward 
uh, to incre increasing numbers of uh, British colleagues and friends uh, would visit to Japan using uh, the newly relaxed uh, border measures. Well, I certainly uh, look forward to being one of those uh, visitors to Japan in the in the relatively near future. Now, I've I'm going. There are quite a number of excellent questions in, um, and I'll take them in groups. But one, a natural topic is COP26 and climate, which you very kindly talked about. And of course, Prime Minister Kishida came to uh, came to visit the Glasgow meeting. I'm going to invite Duncan Bartlett. Uh, to ask his question personally, just kick things off. Um, so he will be unmuted. Um, uh, and Duncan Bartlett is a former BBC correspondent in Japan, now um, has Japan story and also works very actively at SOAS um, and all sorts of issues to do with Japan, UK and, and uh, UK Asia relations. I'm going to preface his question, which is about COP26, by saying just for of course, there's a big gap for all countries between their domestic activities and their international commitments. The UK was particularly criticized for um, authorizing the expansion or considering the authorization of an expansion of a coal mine in Cumbria um, and an oil field in the North Sea and of relaxing air passenger duty on domestic flights simultaneously with negotiating the COP, uh, chairing COP26. So I'm just going to criticize the UK myself and now allow Duncan to ask his question about Japan's connection between domestic and international policies. Well, Bill, thank you for the invitation to ask the question directly. And thank you very much, Ambassador Hayashi, for your comprehensive uh, overview uh, of UK-Japan relations. You mentioned the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, and I thought it was significant that at that meeting, Japan was not among the 46 countries which pledged to phase out coal by the 2040s. In the final plenum of the conference, the President Alok Sharma agreed to change the final communique to include the phrase to uh, phase down coal, not phase out coal instead. Could you explain please ambassador a little bit more about Japan's approach to climate change and the use of coal in particular, please? Well, thank you. Well, uh, coal is of course, uh, one of the important uh, topics uh, to be discussed in Glasgow and I believe in the future as well. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, phasing down of the reliance on coals uh, for energy resources is an important theme, and which I'm very happy to see that the agreement has been reached here in Glasgow. Uh, well, uh, each nation, each state, uh, well, uh, which agreed uh, this uh, Glasgow uh, uh, resulting document need to work in uh, the coming uh, years and uh, for uh, in line totally perfectly in line with the uh, what uh, those countries states agreed in glasgow and the important thing is that uh, we need to keep uh, the uh, relevant human activities together with the uh, uh, works toward uh, decarbonization uh, because uh, there are many countries of the world uh, for some of them uh, reliance on cause uh, uh, for the time being necessary. And the uh, important thing is to, as, as I mentioned about the uh, a part of Japan's assistance, particularly toward other Asian developing countries, is that uh, to transform uh, their uh, thermal power generation uh, technologies and systems toward uh, more uh, decarbonized one, ones uh, with the uh, new kind of technologies uh, necessary to be introduced using, for example, uh, ammonia or hydrogen or uh, well, uh, things like that, or new kind of facilities uh, to make them uh, uh, abated, not unabated uh, facilities, so that uh, zero emission thermal power generation could be possible in the coming years in many countries. Without that, uh, some countries uh, well, are not able to utilize necessary energies uh, for their own uh, welfare of the population or their uh, own uh, domestic business activities. That is critical important. And particularly in Asia, 
Uh, of course, renewable energy is necessary uh, for uh, to be expanded. But in this area, in Asia, mainly those sources are solar energies. And because of the instability and the, some of the inconsistency of the, uh, uh, well, uh, the uh, solar energies could be enjoyed by uh, the country's concern. Some other means of energy sources are necessary. And here, of course, uh, turning to, toward uh, making every effort to renewables or greener energies are uh, uh, important. But uh, as I said earlier, uh, for uh, some time, uh, coals uh, will be utilized by uh, countries, not a uh, few countries, but uh, I, I must say uh, quite some uh, countries concerned. And here, uh, Japan's efforts are just in line with the entire uh, agreement of this uh, conference or entire, uh, in, uh, very co consistent with the trajectory uh, which is necessary to be made, uh, taken by uh, all the members of the international society. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ambassador. I'll just uh, by way of observation um, say that we are, I think, uh, observing, watching. This is one of the things that we want to observe carefully, the, uh, the trajectory of the Kishida administration on, partly because he took the decision to change his environment minister away from the rather popular and photogenic um, young Mr. Koizumi, um, who we all uh, were aware of. And uh, we will be waiting to see uh, what actions really come in the new in the new government. Um, and I think we'll have webinars about that during the next year, I'm sure. Let me move to defense, where we've got a number of questions. Um, uh, for example, Nicholas McLean has asked, is it conceivable with the aim of regional stability that AUKUS might one day become JORKUS? Uh, Maggie Ellis has asked, however, that uh, given that we've got um, fewer defense forces in the UK than we used to, certainly fewer, fewer um, members in the army. How can we really be, uh, be useful? Um, but let me ask Neil Riley, who's asked a more, a more broader general question about uh, joint exercises in the future, if he might like to pose a question about defense. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Hayashi, uh, for your uh, initial words, which I thought were a really good summary of the, the multifaceted nature of the relationship with the UK and Japan. Um, the meeting title is Our Relationship in a Troubled World. Uh, we've seen that uh, lots of tension with Russia in the, the Eastern Europe and, uh, and also increased Navy presence in South China Sea, where we've seen uh, Japanese maritime forces running drills with uh, the US Navy. Uh, China being more assertive, if not more belligerent. So within this context, I thought I'd ask just for some more uh, elaboration, really, on your view of the UK-Japan defence relationship and how it can proceed in the future. Well, thank you very much. Of course, well, uh, this is uh, one of the pillars uh, of the uh, collaboration, the cooperation between our two nations uh, in the coming years or even ahead. And of course, uh, with regard to AUKUS, Japan welcomes uh, these initiatives, uh, which could uh, provide uh, more stability uh, in the area of Asia uh, or in the, in the Pacific uh, region uh, with uh, such well close cooperation in, in the area of defense between three countries concerned, UK, Australia, and the United States. And the, uh, of course, uh, Japan is uh, very much more uh, keenly uh, tried to receive uh, knowledge and information with regard to the activities uh, which could be uh, coming out from this AUKUS uh, framework. Uh, however, for the time being, uh, uh, that's what uh, we are. Uh, we are working uh, quite bilaterally uh, together with uh, those uh, each country is concerned, uh, well, alliance with the United States and quite, uh, well, global and the strategic partnership with the UK and also uh, the uh, similar, uh, very close partnership with Australia in defense field. And of course, uh, you're quite right. Uh, everyone's concern is that uh, there are more and more tensions uh, of, uh, in the world. So, yeah, it is uh, truly, uh, we are living in uh, troubled uh, or uh, difficult uh, world uh, at this moment. And one uh, sort of a, uh, stunning uh, kind of uh, character is that 
some uh, regimes or uh, countries uh, try to challenge the status quo by using what by showing uh, their uh, possible willingness to utilize force, change of the status quo by force. That is being observed in not one or two areas of the world. Uh, you mentioned uh, specific uh, regions uh, uh, of the world today. And the uh, important thing is partners, allies, uh, friends uh, of the world uh, need to show our uh, collaboration and our willingness so that uh, those our uh, activities could be understood as deterrence or deterrent forces vis-a-vis uh, -vis possible uh, unilateral actions by any single uh, uh, multiple states to change status quo in the world by force to uh, uh, not only well uh, verbally speaking but uh, try to change, try to change the borders or uh, try to uh, uh, well realize what uh, one or uh, some uh, states claim. Uh, so those are uh, the, uh, what we are working together and the joint exercises, good examples. And of course, uh, beyond that, uh, perhaps more uh, collaboratory uh, information exchanges or even sharings or uh, policy dialogue uh, for or making a sort of mutual understanding and common uh, ideas uh, to talk, tackle uh, with uh, emergencies uh, which could be occurred. And uh, finally, uh, try to avoid uh, sort of miscalculations or misconducts of one or multiple members of the international society who uh, should not understand they could be successful with using unilateral actions. That's perhaps what uh, UK and Japan need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. May I, I might supplement that with a question that often comes up, which is about intelligence collaboration. Um, we, uh, people often observe that there is this five eyes network, so-called five eyes network, essentially between um, UK, US, uh, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. And it's often speculated that Japan should want to be a sixth eye, a member of that uh, information collaboration intelligence network. What are the obstacles and the potentials, in your view, for greater Japanese participation in intelligence sharing? Well, in this area, uh, of course, well, uh, we feel very much honored, uh, quite often referred to a possible, uh, well, the six uh, participants in this well, uh, well uh, collaboratory uh, society of uh, intelligence cooperation, intelligence sharing. Uh, however, well, of course, well, this five eyes, I understand, uh, has a quite long and uh, good uh, collaboratory uh, background and history. However, uh, Japan has not well uh, worked uh, well as closely as those kind of uh, network uh, in the previous years or uh, time or case. Uh, so at this moment, uh, there is no uh, clear uh, view on the part of Japan uh, whether it is better to join those uh, kind of uh, uh, association or not. But rather than that, uh, we'd like to uh, make a, a good cooperation bilaterally uh, in many fields, uh, perhaps these kind of uh, information or intelligence areas or uh, analysis of the areas uh, could be uh, one of them uh, or some of them. And the, uh, of course, uh, we uh, uh, could work uh, on uh, UK counterparts if possible. And the, this is a, a quite well, uh, very much well complicated areas uh, which uh, require some kind of uh, uh, obligations or uh, even legal kind of uh, restrictions uh, with regard to uh, possible participants of the uh, those dialogue or uh, sharing of the information. So, uh, well, uh, this is uh, uh, not something very much more uh, perhaps clearly uh, discussed area, but the uh, Japan's well current position is that we uh, work and the, uh, talk 
with uh, each one of those uh, member states of five eyes uh, in a very much more professional manner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to change the topic uh, now uh, to the imperial families of our two countries. Um, I'm going to ask, so Claire Weaver has put in a question about the imperial family. And of course, I raise it also because uh, one thing that was frustrated by COVID in 2020 was, of course, the visit by their imperial highnesses, uh, the state visit to the UK that uh, people were very much looking forward to. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Claire to uh, pose her question uh, directly um, about uh, the imperial family, but also you might, in your answer, uh, say a few words also about the prospects for uh, that visit happening in the future. Claire. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Ambassador Hayashi, thank you very much for a very interesting talk so far this morning. Um, just wanted to ask if, given um, the recent media attention, to the wedding of um, ex-Princess Mako. Um, is there any anticipated changes or discussions to the change in the laws for um, accession to the throne and the line of succession, given that the imperial family is now reducing in, in, uh, in size quite dramatically? I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, of course, well, the uh, imperial family, empress and empress, uh, their majesties, uh, uh, very much well respected and the, uh, very much supported by the population and people of Japan. That's uh, uh, perhaps uh, in a similar uh, kind of situation as uh, Her Majesty the Queen and the uh, royal families here in the United Kingdom. Uh, but well, uh, the way for the future uh, uh, is quite well uh, difficult and sensitive matter. And the, uh, it used to be the case that the uh, independent panel, uh, well, uh, panels uh, designated by the government uh, is now uh, go uh, going to make uh, uh, deliberations, arguments about possible uh, future uh, possibilities of, uh, well, accession or uh, as well as the uh, number of imperial families in the future. So uh, perhaps, uh, the position of the government is that yeah, we need to wait uh, for the uh, uh, final outcomes of those independent panel. And also, it is quite important to have uh, national consensus to support the future of uh, the accession or imperial family. So uh, we would like to uh, wait for uh, quite some time uh, toward uh, well, some kind of uh, consensus or decisions will be made uh, inside Japan. But with regard to uh, Bill's point on the state visit of their Majesty's Emperor and Empress, uh, of course, uh, it was uh, expected uh, sometime in year, uh, well, uh, of this year, uh, well, uh, and well, sometime this year, uh, this could be, uh, well, taking place. But uh, because of the uh, pandemic caused by COVID 19, uh, the visit was postponed. So it was postponed. Postponed means, uh, I believe, it will be realized uh, in some time in the future. But the, uh, my personal sense is that uh, the uh, pandemic situation today, uh, well, uh, unfortunately, does not allow to restart discussion about to decide more specifics of the uh, state visit of their Majesty the Emperor and Empress to the United Kingdom. So I very much were uh, looking forward uh, to uh, having uh, the uh, suitable environment with regard to pandemic or social activities, both uh, in UK and Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we would all join you in that, that feeling. Um, changing the subject again, um, Yuriko Takemura has put in an interestingly different question about um, a dual or uh, a nationality and interpersonal relations. I wonder if she would like to ask her question. Yes, I will. I will read out uh, Takemura-san's question. So she says, she writes, it is impossible to build a close desirable relationship between nation states without individual citizens' close personal relationships, of course. If I may, I would like to ask Ambassador Hayashi's personal view on the extension of dual or even multi-nationality for Japanese citizenship. 
Well, citizenship is uh, quite core of the well, uh, identification of nation uh, uh, citizens, and the, uh, it is decided by each nation. Uh, well, uh, particularly for democracies with uh, democratic means, and here uh, it is a parliament to decide a law if uh, there is any necessity to change the current uh, legal background. So uh, I would like to uh, wait uh, for any kind of discussions, arguments, deliberations in the parliament. But so far, uh, of course, uh, Japanese law of nationality uh, does not allow a double citizenship or a double nationality. Uh, uh, that is perhaps well uh, the point uh, uh, Takemura-san uh, is hoping to raise today. Uh, that is the current situation, and the, because. Uh, uh, well, the, the, as a nation uh, which is uh, a very strictly observed rule of law, uh, we now, uh, well, government and the uh, like embassy here, uh, need to abide by uh, this rule of today. But of course, this is a rule uh, which could be changed uh, with the, uh, uh, well, uh, necessary and the, uh, well, uh, legitimate uh, post procedures uh, set by the constitution and the uh, legal background, of course, that is the, uh, made by parliament. So, uh, of course, well, this not satisfy your point, but the, uh, perhaps in today's world, uh, lots of exchanges are made uh, without regard to uh, differences of nationality or citizenship. And here, of course, uh, lots of uh, British people, Japanese people are uh, making such close and the uh, vibrant exchanges between each, uh, each other. And of course, uh, you are quite true that uh, it is individuals who play uh, the most important roles for the relations between countries or states concerned. So uh, I very much hope uh, those exchanges will be uh, improved or expanded and the, uh, if there is uh, issues of uh, nationality, this could be uh, duly, appropriately discussed. And the uh, well, uh, if there is any agreement in the future, uh, eventually decided by the parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are very close to running out of time, unfortunately. So I'm going to ask uh, Ambassador Hayashi to close, perhaps, with um, by asking him this. I wonder if looking ahead. At the, obviously the rest of 2021, but especially 2022. Um, I wonder if what for you, insofar as it's predictable, are some important milestones or important developments that you're looking forward to um, in UK, Japan, but also in your time in the UK? Well, uh, this is a important but difficult question to answer. Uh, <laughs> we are facing uh, such a well, unprecedented situation caused by the pandemic. So uh, first thing uh, will be that we need to uh, see uh, what will be the consequences of the uh, uh, next year. And well, of course, I'm very hopeful that uh, well, pre-pandemic uh, activities or uh, exchanges uh, could return back uh, well as early as possible and the, uh, particularly next year. But uh, still, at this stage, uh, I just hope that. And of course, well, well uh, before closing, may I uh, well uh, refer to very famous sentences made by Tolstoy in his uh, start of the uh, famous literature, Anna Kalerina. He said, happy families are all, all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Well, this is quite famous, but well, my point is that Every nation, every state is unique in its own way. And of course, United Kingdom is so unique. And so is Japan as well. And because of that, our partnership, our friendship, our bonds, relations are so unique. And my uh, well, strong desire is to cultivate, to widen and deepen this unique bonds, unique uh, partnership between ourselves. Thank you very much, Bill, and the, uh, all the audiences today. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Ambassador. And we too all look forward to continuing that relationship in a spirit of mutual support, of course, criticism of each other when necessary, but uh, always with a spirit of, of uh, constructive progress. Um, and I thank the audience for joining. Thanks for lots of excellent questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them, but I thank Ambassador Hayashi both for his very uh, inspiring and comprehensive remarks, but also for answering so many questions. I wish you a good day. I wish everyone a good day. And I look forward very much to seeing you all in person as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, see you in person very soon.